Hello everyone. Welcome back to this training on introduction to base hyperspectral observations for water quality monitoring. This is part three and today we are going to talk about access and visualization of base OCI data using Python and Jupyter Notebook software. Our guest instructors today are Drs. Anna Windel and Karina Paulin. Both are from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and I will introduce them briefly. So today is the final concluding session of this training and uh, homework is posted on our website today. Uh, so please uh, get the homework and it's due by 24th of October. So those of you who complete the homework by the deadline and who have attended all three live sessions, you will receive a certificate of completion. We'll start with a brief review of part two. We had Dr. Morgan McKibben, uh, base applications lead, um, talked about a number of things. Uh, she talked about applications program, which is formed for decision-making activities in water resources, fisheries, and ecosystem areas. Uh, we also saw examples of base early adopters. Uh, we saw case studies where uh, aquaculture site selection is based on base data, also enhanced cholera risk modeling, and also saw a web tool hypercost for water quality monitoring in lakes and estuaries. Then we had description and access to multiple levels of PACE data. Uh, and there's a link to PACE data access landing page, not only different levels, but we also saw products which are currently available, which are under preparation, uh, some which are under testing and validation. So all the information can be found from here. Uh, data access is uh, through OB TAC page for level three and four products and level one and two products and three and four, they're all available from NASA Earth Data Search as well, we saw that. Uh, we, uh, Morgan uh, showed NASA Worldview snapshot, uh, which provides near real time pace, true color images and chlorophyll A concentration data. And then we had a brief demonstration of CDAS where we uh, looked at and analyzed preliminary analysis of uh, base data, uh, especially level two data. With that, we'll start with today's ob objectives. Um, so by the end of this training, you should be able to access OCI remote sensing reflectances and level two and three water quality parameters from Earth data using open source Python software and Jupyter notebooks. Uh, then visualize OCI remote sensing reflectances and level two and three water quality parameters using the same software and um, identify steps to customize the provided Jupyter notebook software for other areas of interest and timeframes. Again, as in the previous sessions, you can put your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. And please feel free to enter your questions as we go, and we will try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session after the webinar. Uh, the remainder of the questions will be answered in the question and answer document, which will be posted on the training website about a week after the training. So with that, we invite our guest speakers, and I want to introduce them. Uh, Dr. Anna Windel. She is a satellite mission postdoctoral fellow here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and she's working on developing methodologies to derive base phytoplankton community composition. She received her Master's of Environmental Management from Duke University and her PhD in Marine, Estuarine, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science at Horn Point Lab in Cambridge, Maryland. Her expertise in satellite and drone remote sensing, ocean color, and optical oceanography. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Karina Paulin, she is a scientific designer in Ocean uh, Ecology Lab here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. She received her uh, master's in uh, environmental research from the University of Sherbrooke in Canada, and also her PhD in remote sensing and physics of remote sensing from University of Sherbrooke in Canada. So we uh, invite both of them to talk about um, base open source software, uh, Python and Jupyter Notebook to access and analyze and visualize data. 
So take it away, Anna and Karim. Thank you. So today we'll be accessing and visualizing PACE ocean color imager data or OCI using Python um, and Jupyter notebooks. So with PACE, we're entering, um, or we have entered a new era for water quality monitoring. PACE launched uh, earlier this year on February 8th, and um, PACE has three instruments um, and has the ocean color imager, which I mentioned, which is a hyperspectral imager, um, and it also has two polarimeters. So we are also getting hyper and multispectral polarimetry data. Um, so with the with this these new streams of data, we have new data challenges. So we're hoping this training helps um, some of you access and, and analyze um, PACE data a little bit more easily. So the first tutorial we're going to do is an orientation of Earth data cloud access. So before the Jupyter notebook, I'm going to share a few slides to to set the stage. So where is PACE located? It's located in the cloud, um, and what that means is it's located in computers that are physically in Oregon. So uh, it's in an Amazon Web Service or AWS cloud that's that's in Oregon. Um, this is actually a picture of the facility, um, the Amazon Web Service facility that's full of computers that hosts um, not just PACE data, but all of um, NASA's Earth data um, science data. And this region is called AWS US West 2 region. Um, there's regions all over the country, but it's important to know this one um, because if you want to be processing as well in the cloud, it's it's um, helpful to know to set up your your um, your cloud in, into the same cloud region that the data is located. So PACE data is located in AWS cloud simple storage service buckets or S3 buckets. There's a lot of cloud terminology that might be new to you, so um, I recommend for a crash course on cloud terminology to check out the NASA Earth Data Cloud Cookbook and the links right here, um, part of the slide. So how can I access this PACE data that's in the cloud? So there's three options um, that um, might have already been mentioned in part one or two. You can use Earth Data Search Portal using the OB-DAC, that's the Ocean, Ocean Biology DAC, um, Portal. You can use the OBDAC level three and four browser, or you can use the OBDAC file search. Uh, I just want to mention the OBDAC level one and two browser no longer supports access to PACE data. So if you're familiar with a website that looks like this, where you can go in, choose your satellite, choose the date, um, unfortunately, we can no longer use this with PACE. Um, that's why we're teaching you new new ways to access and find data. So these have links to go to the three different methods. We are going to be focusing on the first one um, today, the Earth Data Search OBDAC portal. So that looks like this. So you navigate to um, earthdata.nasa.gov slash search. I usually, um, first thing I do is press browse portals on the left-hand side and I click on OBDAC. Um, because I'm interested in the Ocean Biology DAC, which has the PACE data. And then you can also filter instruments. So we have a bunch of instruments. Um, OCI is the hyperspectral um, ocean color imager that we're focusing on today. So you can click that. And then it takes you to a page where it lists all of the different data that OCI is collecting. So um, you can see here the different titles. We have 20 matching collections, level two apparent optical properties. We have level one B, level three. So they're not really um, organized in such a way, but you can just scroll through and see the different data types. If you press this eye icon here, the information icon, it takes you to a page that looks like this, where it gives you a little bit more information. So it gives you the short name, which is important. Um, we'll come back to that in the coding tutorial, but this is where you can find the short names for different data sets. It also show, shows you the region, the S3 bucket that I talked about, and the credentials. So just a little bit more of where this data is located. You can download the data directly. If you have an Earth Data login, um, your username and password, you can log in here. You can download individual files just by clicking this icon. Downloads directly to your, your local laptop or computer. You can add multiple files um, and then and download um, a bunch of different files at the same time. And when you click 
um, a file on the right hand side, it shows a map and it highlights the granule on the map. So it's a nice way to to see what where um, that data is is on the map. Um, so, you know, if you want an open ocean granule, you probably wouldn't choose this one because it's over um, the continent of Africa. And so, yeah, this is the last page of downloading data. You can um, add a bunch, um, you know, if you want 50 granules, 100 granules, you can add them here, download, um, and, and you can check the status of, of the downloading right here. And you can pull these local files, so they're on your local laptop computer. You can pull them into whatever you're, you're used to analyzing satellite data with, whether that's Python, MATLAB, R, you can pull them into CDAS. They're there. You have them. Um, you can do, you know, whatever you're used to with, with, say, MODIS or or other other satellite data. You can do the same thing with PACE data. An alternative to what I just explained, um, an alter uh, alternative to the Earth Data Search GUI is this Earth Access Python library. So this is a Python library you can import. Um, and it's a really easy way to search, download, or stream NASA Earth science data using a few lines of code. And what I be, what I mean by stream, just like you stream videos and movies on, on Netflix, you can stream the data from the cloud to your local computer without ever having to download that data. So that data never really touches your local, your local system, um, but you have access to it. Um, and so we'll explain that in the tutorial as well. So this Python library, it is under active development. Um, if you have an issue, you can submit issues on their GitHub. Um, it was originally developed at the National Snow and Ice Data Center, um, but it now has many contributors. Anyone can contribute. They have a nice contributing guide. Um, and this is what we're gonna use to access PACE data in the Jupyter Notebook tutorials today. So there's two ways to run these Jupyter Notebooks that we have set up. Um, you can do it locally. So we have provided instructions in the pre prerequisites of this training that has a predefined environment YAML file. So um, you can follow the instructions. We have Mac and Windows instructions to install that the um, to download that YAML file and install Jupyter Lab and the required Python libraries. And if you have any questions on that, you can um, ask us in the chat or afterwards. You can also run these Jupyter notebooks in the cloud. But you do have to have access to what's called an Elastic Compute Cloud or an EC2, such as a cloud-based Jupyter Hub. So some examples are Jupyter Hubs maintained by OpenScapes, CryoCloud, NASA Goddard has an Open Science Studio. These are Jupyter Hubs um, that are located in the cloud in the same region as where PACE data is located. So it makes streaming really simple. Um, EC2, right, EC2 needs to be running in the AWS West, US West 2 region. The NASA Earth Data Cloud Cookbook, I'm putting that link in again, um, definitely encourage folks to, to check this out and read up on um, cloud computing and how to maybe set up your own EC2. There's some universities that have institution, institutional accounts, but since not everyone right now has equal access to an EC2 in the cloud, we're going to be demonstrating how to run these notebooks locally. So we encourage you to use, follow the instructions that we provide um, and install Jupyter Lab locally. So we're going to go ahead and transition to the notebook now. Okay, so this is, I'm going to start with the notebook already open and ready to go. So if you have, um, if you successfully downloaded Jupyter Lab, um, you should have in your left hand side the contents. You'll have two notebooks. I only have one here, but you'll have the second one that Karina is going to do after this. And then you'll have your environment.yaml file. And if you click on this notebook, it will open up on the right hand side and it should look like this. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, quick summary of this notebook this is the orientation to Earth Data Cloud Access. In this example, we will use the Earth Access Python package to search for PACE ocean color imager products on NASA Earth data. Um, some more links if you want to learn more about Earth Access. Um, but in short, Earth Access helps authenticate with an Earth data login. It makes search easier and provides a streamlined way to load data into X array containers. X ray is another Python library that we'll introduce if you're not familiar. Um, 
And here's the documentation and just be aware that earth access is under active development. So if something isn't working one day, um, you know, you can submit an issue or, or make sure you always have the most, most updated version. So learning objectives at the end of this notebook, you should know how to store your NASA earth data login credentials, how to use earth access to search for OCI data using search filters, how to download OCI data, how to use X-ray to plot data, and how to stream OCI data. So we will start with step number one, setup. So we begin by importing the packages. This is pretty standard for um, any notebook. You'll see a bunch of imports at the beginning. Um, and to run this notebook, I'll note you when you highlight a code, a, a chunk of code or a cell of code, you can either press this button up here, this play, this is run this cell and advance to the next cell, or you can simply do shift enter. So when I do shift enter, you'll see that the, the little asterisk um, shows, that means it's running. And then when it changes to a number, it means it's done. You can also see it up here in this kernel status when it's empty or um, not filled, it's idle. When it's running, I'll run this again. Well, it didn't work, um, but it's filled. It's, solid so you can tell when things are running by here or uh, right here. So these are um, some packages, earth access, x-ray, matplotlib, cartopy, num, numpy, um, and then this x-ray open data tree. So these are all different Python libraries that we're importing that are already installed um, because you downloaded this environment YAML file. Okay, step two, NASA Earth Data Authentication. So hopefully <clears throat> you have all signed up for a NASA Earth Data account. That was also one of the pre prerequisites for this training. So you have a login, a username, and a password. So what this does, this line of code right here, Earth Access, that's the, the Python library, dot login, persist equals true. You're gonna run that. And if you're running it for the first time ever, you're gonna get a pop-up that says, enter your username and password. So go ahead and do that. Hopefully you remember. Um, and then what that does, it saves the username and password in a .netrc file that's saved in your home directory. So that means it's hidden, so you might have to view hidden files, but that .netrc file is there forever. You never have to create that again, um, but you just have to run this line. So this line of code finds that .netrc and it logs you into Earth Access or Earth Data, essentially. So we'll go on to step number three, search for data. So we're gonna use the earth .search datasets function, um, which accepts an instrument filter as an easy way to get started. So we'll go ahead and run this line that um, search datasets that contains um, the OCI instrument. And then we'll run this little loop that goes through um, all of the results and prints the short name. So remember the short name is the the name when you press the I icon or the information icon in the Earth Data GUI. So we'll run this and we'll see that um, all of the PACE OCI short names. So you can see um, all the way from level zero, level one, two, three. Um, I think in part one or two, they go over the different um, data types. Uh, so these are all of the different data types and, and uh, parameters that you can get uh, with search data sets. So we'll use this search data function to, to find granules within a collection. So we're gonna use the short name PACE OCI level two L2 BGC, which stands for biogeochemical properties and near real time or NRT. And then we're gonna use the count argument to limit the number of granules. Uh, so we'll just do the just one, one result of this short name. So we'll go ahead and run that. Um, but if we want to refine our search a little bit more, we can use um, to describe the, the spatiotemporal do domain of our case. So we can use the temporal parameter to request a date range. So in this case, we're going to find all of the, the OCI level 2 BGC near real time data in July. Uh, we can put a bounding box, so put lat long coordinates um, to request, re request granules that intersect with a bounding box. This is a box um, located over the Chesapeake Bay on the east coast of the U.S. And we can put a cloud cover threshold. So 0 to 50, we want file, we want data grant, or, um, 
granules that have zero, either zero to 50% cloud cover. So we can run that. And then we can just do the earth access.search data function again to search for data using those different filters. So we can print the results. So remember, this is saved as results. We can index the first, second, and third um, granules in those results. And that looks like this. So I'm going to run them all. And it shows you um, the name of the data. You, you can actually press this right here, and it'll take you, um, might not work because I'm full. Oh, yeah. It'll take you to, um, you know, a place where you can download it directly to your computer. So that's kind of a, a nice way, um, just like the GUI, but you can use this and then directly download the files this way. It also prints a useful quick look of the image. So this is, um, I believe, chlorophyll A concentration quick look. So you can look if you, you know, if you're wanting data in the Chesapeake Bay, you probably wouldn't choose this one because it doesn't look like there's a lot of data and zoom in. Um, but yeah, really helpful to just see where, uh, you know, where data is being masked because of clouds and, and where coverage is. So, um, and you can see cloud hosted equals true. That's because PACE data is hosted in the cloud, like we talked about. So let's go ahead and go to step number four, download data. So we're going to download a couple granules using the earthaccess.download function. So we're going to use search data, and then we're going to use download. So let's go ahead. We're, this is the same um, lines of code that we ran before. So we're finding level two BGC using the same um, temporal bounding box cloud cover thresholds. And then we're going to do earthaccess.download. So this does something different. Um, it's saving the results into a file called level, a folder called level two data. So now on the left hand side, you should see a folder that popped up. If you click in, you can see the four granules that, um, that the, this search data um, code found. So remember, it's all of the data that intersects the Chesapeake Bay in the month of July using 50% or less cloud threshold. So we now have that data downloaded locally. So let's go ahead and open it. So now that we have it downloaded, we're going to use X-Ray. So we're importing X-Ray as XR. So wherever you see XR, that is using the X-Ray Python library. And we're going to use the function open data set. And we're calling the first granule in the path. So paths is the variable um, that we're calling this download func this download call. So we're indexing the first granule in this paths variable. So that looks like this if you run it. So X-ray data set has nothing but attributes. So all of these are grayed out except for attributes, which you can open and look at the different attributes, but that's all you can see. Um, so we're going to use this, this function called X-ray open data tree, which we imported before. Um, it's it is going to be implemented in into X-Ray, um, but it's under development. So this is just a, a kind of quick way to, to use it. And what it does is it puts the groups in the file. So now we have attributes, but we also have groups. And when you expand groups, you can see the different level two groups within the NetCDF file. So you have sensor band pr pr uh, parameters with all of the variables. You have scan line attributes with all of the variables. You have geophysical data with all of the variables. This is probably the one that you're um, interested in, in the most because it contains the actual biogeochemical data like chlorophyll, uh, particulate organic carbon, things like that. There's navigation data, which is the lat long, um, and processing control. So big uh, data set that, that you can open. We're going to merge all of those groups. So um, we're going to merge all of those groups into a single data set. So that looks like this. So now you have just one data set, all of the variables all together, and the dimensions um, within the net CDF. So we have this data set called data set. Um, and we're going to do a quick plot of the chlorophyll A variable using image show. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. 
So we're pulling the chlorophyll A variable, plotting it, and the V max, that's the, the range of chlorophyll values. So we're only plotting values um, from zero to five milligrams per cubic meter of chlorophyll. So you can see um, it's, it's being quickly plotted, um, defined by the number of lines or scan line on the y-axis and pixels per line. So if you want to plot with lat long as coordinates, you can do the same thing. So um, we have to set the coordinates here. Uh, this is an x-ray function. And then we're going to do the same thing, calling chlorophyll A, plotting it, but we're um, going to declare that the x and y are longitude latitude. So we'll run that. And now we have longitude on the x-axis, latitude on the y-axis, and you can see that the um, granules shifted a little bit to match the lat long grid. And if you want to get fancy, you can use this Cartopy uh, Python library and add um, coastline. So here's the coastline of the east coast of the US and grid lines um, just to make it a little bit more pretty and useful. Okay, so that's quick and easy chlorophyll map. Let's now download level three mapped data. So we're going to use a new search filter available in, in Earth Access search data. The granule name argument accepts strings with the asterisk wildcard. So you can see that right here. So we need this to distinguish daily day from eight day composites or monthly composites, and also to get all of the data in we want 0.1 degree resolution. So this granule name parameter is new. Um, we're now looking for data in April, um, soon after data was released. And the short name we're using is PACE OCI Level 3 Mapped Chlorophyll Near Real Time. So let's go ahead and run all of this at the same time. You can see that earthaccess.download is downloading the results of this searching and downloading it into a new folder called Level 3 Data. So after this works, you should see on the left-hand side a new folder called Level 3 Data. It'll pop up after this downloads. There it is. So if you go into that, you can see all of the Level 3 map data that we just downloaded. You can expand this to see, yep, we want a day. Um, level 3 mapped doesn't, doesn't tell you the, oh, yes, it does. And we wanted 0 0.1 degree. So that's there. We'll go back this. So same thing, we can use x-ray to open the first level three map file. Looks like this. Um, because level three map variables have lat long coordinates, it's possible to stack multiple granules along a new dimension that corresponds to time. So this is a cool little feature. Instead of x-ray open data set, we're going to use x-ray open MF data set, which stands for multiple files. So we're going to um, run this, this cell right here. We're using open MF data set. We're going to use all of the data files in paths, which is, remember, um, everything in that level three folder. We're going to use combine equals nested to combine, combine the files according to the shape of the array of files, and we're going to use concatenate dimension date, uh, which generates a new dimension in the combined data set um, because date is not an existing dimension. So let's go ahead and run that and see what we get. So up here, we're opening just one file. We're indexing just the first file. We see lat long, we see the data variables. But when you do multiple files, MF data set, we're combining all 13. We're adding a new dimension. So we have all 13 files in this data set now, which is really helpful for like time series analysis or, or compositing. So that's what we're gonna show here. A common reason to generate a single data set for multiple daily images is to create a composite. So let's run this cell first. This is using um, just, um, this is a mapping a single day. So you can see it's, it's pulling chlorophyll, it's logging it right here. Um, this is just some Python um, or plotting code to, to change the color palette. They change the aspect and size of the plot. And we're plotting the very first date. So the first date uh, in this data set. 
So you can see the, the global map, but there's a lot of gaps because of cloud cover and because of the um, um, orbiting doesn't doesn't cover all of the places on on the globe. So what we want to do is composite all 13 images. So we're doing that here. We're going to take the mean of all 13 images and we're going to plot that. So see here, we're calculating the mean. We're, we're going to plot that chlorophyll average and it's going to look a little bit nicer. So here we go. More gaps are filled. Um, there's still some gaps because of cloud cover, but you get a more complete picture of chlorophyll A in the global oceans. And this is from 13 dates. So if you added more dates, it would be um, probably more filled because you have more data to fill in those gaps. Cool. Okay, last step, step seven, um, gonna teach you how to stream data from the Earth Data Cloud. So we've been doing this the whole time, Earth access .search data. We're gonna continue doing that. Um, but we're now gonna, if you see down here, we're gonna use earth access .open. That's a new function. We've been using earth access .download. .open function is used when you want to directly read bytes from a remote file system, but not download a whole file. So when running code on a host with direct access to the NASA Earth Data Cloud, AKA a Jupyter Hub uh, EC2 instance that is in the cloud, you don't necessarily need to download the data and Earth Access Open is the way to go. If you use Earth Access .open while not running on a remote host with direct access to the, Earth, to the Earth's data cloud, you can still use it, but performance will be poor. And this isn't a problem, problem with the cloud or with Earth Access. It has to do with the data format and may soon be improved. So you can stream data, whether you're running this notebook locally or in the cloud, but it's going to be a little bit more um, efficient if you're cloud to cloud, if you're if you're running the Jupyter notebook in the cloud and you're accessing data in the cloud. But we'll go ahead and show um, how you do it here. So we'll go ahead and run this. We're searching for data. We're back to the level two BGC data. We're going to use that um, the date range, BBox and clouds as before. And then we're going to do earth access .open results. And you're just gonna be able to tell it's gonna take a little longer. So it's not downloading the files to your local laptop or computer anymore. So you're not gonna see new files on the left-hand side. It's streaming the data and it's being saved. Um, just, it's, it's just being streamed. It's not saving anywhere. So you can see how long it's taking. Um, I'll go ahead and, and keep talking while it's still streaming. So, when this finishes, the paths list will contain references to the files on the remote system. Um, when I run paths, you'll see that the data is coming from this OB Cumulus Prod Public. That's the, the S3 bucket in the Amazon Web Service region um, where the data is coming from. So I, I think it ran. No, yeah, it ran. I guess it just didn't load here. Um, so yeah, when you run paths, you can see the the link here where the data is coming from. So this OB Cumulus Prod, Prod Public, but you can open up the files the same way. You can use this open data tree, indexing the first file in, in paths, and it will take a little bit longer, as you can see. But um, you can open the data without it ever touching your local laptop, um, which is powerful, but at this time, if you're doing it locally, it could take a little bit longer than as if you just download the data. So that's why we um, we explained how to download the data locally. So this should run, um, but after that, uh, you have completed this notebook on the Earth Access Cloud Act, um, Earth, oopsie, Earth Data Cloud Access. And I encourage you now to check out the satellite data visualization notebook for more training. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for this. Um, now we're going to look at uh, the visualization of optical remote sensing data for water quality monitoring. Um, so uh, one thing you might have seen before uh, in other parts of this training, but I think it's uh, good to always good to be reminded of that uh, is uh, that all the data products uh, from PACE are uh, listed on the PACE data products table uh, in the PACE website. So if you 
want to find which data you are interested in visualizing uh, and uh, how those um, those uh, products are, are named and uh, what goes behind uh, those products uh, for your visual your visualizations and um, you uh, should have a look at the paste data products table and i'm going to just quickly introduce some of the products uh, we're going to be visualizing today um, first um, we have the spectral remote sensing reflectances so remote sensing reflectances or rrs as you may know it and um, this is a, a, a data product uh, for ocean remote sensing uh, that has existed uh, for a while uh, for PACE. Um, what is new is that it's now hyperspectral. We have 256 wavelengths in the visible. Uh, so we're um, going to uh, work on visualizing uh, that today because uh, that is a, a challenge to <laughs> use uh, the, that entire spectrum. Um, there in, is in the table the surface reflectance product. Uh, we're not going to visualize it today. Uh, it's an, um, it's going to be uh, used in uh, some applications. Um, and uh, we have the apparent visible wavelength, uh, that is a new data product uh, from PACE2 uh, that will use the entire spectrum from OCI and analyze it to tell us which wavelength dominates the spectrum. So, uh, for example, it, it will give us uh, one wavelength uh, that could be in the blue, uh, closer to 400 nanometers, and uh, that would tell us that the water is bluer. If it gives us a wavelength more uh, closer to 550, uh, more green, uh, that means that the water is greener. Um, so that is uh, a very interesting new product uh, that can be uh, used uh, for water quality monitoring and uh, we are going to learn to visualize it today. If you want more information about how it, those products are calculated, uh, look at the right-hand side column and click on those links and you will find all the technical documents, uh, the, the publications uh, that um, allow us uh, to, to produce uh, those uh, data sets. Another uh, place you should uh, look at uh, when you are preparing to visualize uh, place data is the what you should know about place data page on our website. Um, so I, we uh, will learn different things about place data that are important. Um, for example, um, we have a sun synchronous polar orbit uh, with PACE, so that means we are only getting data during the day. Um, we have three instruments on board. Um, we have OCI, the Ocean Call Instrument, which is the the one that we are going to uh, work with today. Uh, and we have two parameters, HARP2 and SPEX1. Um, OBIDAC processes and distributes the data from PACE, and uh, there's different data processing levels from the raw instrument data that comes from the satellite to uh, level four geophysical products that are combined uh, from uh, level three maps. Um, today, we are going to work mostly with level two data, which is the derived geophysical science data products uh, on granules. Uh, so uh, for a specific area uh, that the, the satellite has um, measured, uh, you will have products like chlorophyll A, uh, for example, um, those are in the level two products. Uh, or uh, we will also use level three products, uh, which are uh, composited uh, either temporarily or spatially or both. So you can have, for example, a global monthly map of a product like chlorophyll uh, in the level three products. Uh, so we are going uh, to be visualizing those. Um, there's uh, different product maturity levels uh, with uh, the satellite data. Um, the standard products uh, need to be validated. We're still working on validation. PACE has been launched pretty recently, so uh, that's uh, still ongoing. So for now, all the data is provisional or test. Um, there are some issues uh, with some bands uh, that we are working on. Um, in the meantime, you want to look at, uh, at that table uh, of the problematic bands of uh, the different instruments of PACE. Uh, so this page is updated regularly, so you will have the latest information. But uh, for example, the events that are 
read um, are to be avoided. So if you're working on an algorithm or you're um, working on a visualization and uh, you want to make sure your data is accurate, you want to avoid uh, these uh, wavelengths. Uh, so uh, just an example um, where the OCI instrument um, goes from uh, red band, uh, from blue bands to red bands, uh, there is a discontinuity in the spectrum. Uh, so uh, that um, area around 600 nanometers should be avoided. So you should have a look at that uh, table whenever you want to prepare a visualization or you want to work with data. Um, there's also events that can affect your uh, data, the, our data collection, um, and uh, that's something that uh, you can explore too. So you, you can choose different dates and uh, you can see with the, all, either the whole observatory or each of the individual instruments if uh, there's an absence of data due to an event or uh, just a reduced quality of data. Uh, there's other um, information on that uh, page, but uh, those are the, the main ones I wanted to just remind you of uh, today, um, just to make sure we're ready to uh, visualize uh, pays data. Um, now we are ready to go to the Jupyter Notebook uh, part of uh, of this training to actually work on some visualization. Um, and we are going to do first an easy global chlorophyll A map, a second a map of the global oceans in quasi-true color, and then a full remote sensing reflectance spectrum from a global ocean and a water quality co uh, parameter map of a specific area. So let's jump to the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so we have our satellite data visualization notebook here. Uh, hopefully you have your Earth data login already uh, and uh, you have followed Anna's uh, orientation to Earth data cloud access uh, tutorial. Uh, those um, cover concepts that we uh, will need, uh, tools and concepts that we will need uh, for uh, this uh, part of the tutorial. So again, I'm going to quickly repeat what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to create a quick global chlorophyll map from OCI data. We're going to create a quasi true color image uh, from OCI data, a full and interactive uh, remote sensing reflectance spectrum. And we're going to map a water quality product over a specific area. Let's get started. First, our imports. So uh, for data visualizations, uh, there are some specific imports uh, uh, some specific libraries that you will want to import. So we have a uh, whole of views here. Uh, we have pillow. Um, we have a uh, cartopie with uh, the cartopie image tiles. Uh, and uh, we have the panel widgets. Other uh, libraries uh, you have seen uh, before in the previous training. So I'm going to go ahead and import these. Then we want um, then we want to authenticate using Earth Access. Now we're going to download some data. So uh, first we're uh, building uh, that easy <laughs> global chlorophyll A map. Um, no, so we will need uh, the chlorophyll A level three product uh, for that. Um, we are searching for that type of product here. So that's a short name. Uh, we are looking for a monthly product and a 0 0.1 degree resolution. And we're looking at the month of August because that's the latest month we're able to access here. So we can go ahead and download it. It will create the Hill Tree data folder here. Like Anna has showed you. Just wait a second. There we go. Now we can go ahead and look at our data set. So we can see we have the chlorophyll A variable that we're interested in and um, the geographical coordinates because it's a level three file. So it's already uh, mapped uh, along latitude and longitude. Now uh, we can just name a variable from the uh, variable in the data set and we're already ready to map. Uh, so we're using the plot function to map. Um, you're, we're, we're using the Verdis color map. This is the default color map uh, with Python. Uh, I find that it works well for chlorophyll, but uh, there are many other color maps uh, from Matplotlib that you should uh, explore. Um, uh, feel uh, free to, to play with that. 
uh, we are using the robust equal, equal true argument because um, we want to remove outliers and uh, we are setting our figure size and aspect ratio. So here we are, already a very simple global chlorophyll A map from a level three product. Now let's move to a slightly more complex visualization. We're going to work on a global ocean uh, in quasi true color map. Um, so quasi true color uh, comes from the fact that when uh, we build a true color image is um, something that looks similar to a photograph that we will take. Um, so those are uh, made with red, green, and blue channels, so RGB. Um, a true color satellite image uh, for uh, our data sets comes from um, a surface reflectance product. Uh, for a quasi true color, it's the remote sensing reflectance that we're using. So the product is going to be similar to true color, but not quite. So that's why we call it quasi true color. So we're using the remote sensing reflectance, as I said, RRS. So we're going to get that data set. Uh, we want a global map. Uh, so uh, we're going with that uh, level three file um, and we're getting a monthly product to have the least amount of clouds that we can get. And uh, we uh, again, are using the 0.1 degree resolution in the month of August. Let's download this. Here we go. Now we are ready to have a look at our data set. Uh, so here we see latitude, longitude, RRS, and we see wavelength because um, RRS is a multi-dimensional <laughs> variable. Uh, we are uh, using uh, 256 different wavelengths uh, with uh, remote sensing reflectance uh, compared to our previous var variable we used, which was just chlorophyll, which was um, just one uh, dimension. Uh, so with remote sensing reflectance, we have all the wavelengths. Um, so we can have a look at um, all the wavelengths that are available. Um, so I wanted to list them all here because uh, in the next step, we have to choose the wavelength. Um, for uh, a true color image or a quasi true color image, we're interested in uh, getting wavelengths that are red, green, and blue to go in our red, green, and blue channels. Um, so. Uh, we're going uh, with 645 for red, 555 for green, and 450 for blue. Um, if you're interested in building a false color image for some application you have, um, that's possible. You just uh, use the different wavelengths that uh, you're interested in that will highlight um, that feature. Um, but it's, it's the same principle. But here we're staying with red, green, and blue. So um, you can choose different wavelengths of red, green, and blue, uh, because we have so many to choose from in a hyperspectral data set. Uh, these are uh, some that give good results, but they're not the only ones, so feel free to explore that. So here we're going to do our data set, uh, which is reduced now uh, with just our three, uh, our three wavelengths that we chose. And then we are going to name these with our red, green, and blue channels. So now we have the channel added here and now we're ready for a first visualization we are going to show these three different channels uh, individually um, in a plot with three subplots um, and uh, we're going to share the same x-axis and then we're uh, going to build every um, one of these uh, plots individually with their own uh, color map uh, so we'll have the red plot is going to be red, the green plot is going to be green, like this. And it's good. We are plotting along longitude and latitudes. So we can see here we have our three channels, uh, they show different parts of the data. Uh, but now we want to make an RGB image. So we want to combine these three together. So we're going to use the image show function to do that. Um, so we're going to build a figure, uh, set a figure size. We're going uh, to tell uh, Cartopi that um, the data is on the plat carry projection. We're going to add uh, coastlines. Uh, we can choose the color of the coastlines, the line width, 
with the transparency with the alpha. And uh, we, we can change the background color. Here we're using white. And then we're plotting with the longitude, the latitude. And uh, I'm adjusting uh, the Vmin and Vmax here because with remote sensing uh, data, uh, when we're building true color or quasi true color imagery, um, it there's a very wide dynamic range. So uh, it can appear very dark. Um, so we want to reduce that range a little bit. <laughs> that's what, that's how we uh, we do it with the Vmin and Vmax variables. Uh, so um, we, that's a matter of taste and what you want to represent in your image. Do you want something more realistic? Do you want to represent uh, to highlight uh, some features? Uh, so you're welcome to explore uh, different uh, values uh, with these and see what works best for you. Interpolation equals none um, is important here because uh, we're uh, actually compressing an image. Uh, so we're using a larger data set, showing it in a smaller uh, window. Um, it will make a sharper image if we don't do interpolation. Interpolation works if we're going from a smaller data set and we want to stretch it. So that's why we turned it off here. So you can see that the remote sensing reflectance product doesn't cover land. Um, so we might be interested in adding a layer here to uh, to fill that gap. Um, so uh, we will we will add a background map. So here we're building a figure again. Uh, again, uh, we our data is in the plat carry projection. So uh, we're letting uh, Cartopi know that, and uh, we are um, using the whole map. Uh, so we are also letting Cartopi know that, and we are adding the background image. Uh, there are many choices of maps in Cartopi. Uh, here uh, we're uh, using the basic satellite view of Google Maps, um, and we are then building the same remote sensing reflectance map that we had with that background. Here we go. And we can even zoom in in a region of interest. Uh, with this, uh, so we'll use the set extent function for that. Uh, so we'll uh, set our extent uh, with uh, the um, geographical coordinates uh, of our region. Here we're going to zoom on the Chesapeake Bay region, and we're building then the basic same map uh, with the background. Um, sometimes uh, you might want to make sure uh, your your layer. Uh, with the data of interest is in the right uh, Z order. Uh, so I, I'm setting that here for that reason. So here, so uh, we can see the remote sensing reflectance map here uh, with uh, more or less realistic colors. Uh, we can see that it's different in the Chesapeake Bay from the open ocean. So that all makes sense. That's good. We have the Google Maps background here, and we have our coastline fr uh, from Cartapai, um, all in the same projection. Um, so that's that's what we want here. And now uh, we have only explored three of the 256 wavelengths of OCI. So we want to play with the whole spectrum. So let's get started with that. Um, so not only do we want to look at the whole spectrum, but we want to build an interactive map uh, that will allow us to look at the spectrum at different locations. For that, um, we will use the whole views extension Boca, uh, which is very useful to build interactive uh, visualizations in Python. So we are going to download the level three remote sensing reflectance map again, uh, just like the, the previous uh, product. Actually, so we're doing a monthly 0 0.1 degree resolution for the month of August. Then we are going to uh, build a function um, that uh, allows us uh, to uh, select a wavelength that we're interested in and then uh, build an image uh, at that wavelength of the remote sensing uh, reflectance along a lot longitude and latitudes. I'm just going to wait for the map to build. So we here use that function with a single wavelength, uh, the 368 nanometers. Um, uh, so we see the, the map at that wavelength. And here you see uh, there's information when I hover over it. So we see the information in the data set, the latitude, the longitude, and the remote sensing reflectance that changes when I 
when I move, this is because we have the tools equals over option here. So um, that's an interactive map. You can zoom in, you can hover, but that's not the spectrum that we're interested in, right? We only see one band, so we have to build a function to explore the spectrum. Uh, so we're doing that here. Uh, we're going uh, to build an array um, that um, when we uh, select longitude and latitude will uh, give us a, a curve with uh, the wavelengths and the remote sensing reflectance, so our spectrum. And so we are selecting here uh, the, the location, so pixel 00, zero in this image. And we get the spectrum at that exact uh, location. And now we want to build our interactive maps that combines um, those uh, two uh, visualizations. So we will be able to click on the map uh, to see the, the spectrum changing at the different locations. So um, first we are building a slider that will allow us to choose uh, the, the wavelength uh, for the background map. And then we are building the capability to show the spectrum at the point that we click on the map. So you see the slider here and we're building our map. Here we go. So there's still that hover function, but when I click, you can see the spectrum here on the right changes. So for example, if I look at a place in the wide open ocean, the spectrum looks like this. But if I look in a coastal region, it's very different. And um, so uh, this is a very uh, interactive and interesting map that you can build. Uh, you can zoom in. As you can see, um, you can uh, save uh, that figure uh, when you're you have, you're happy with the location you have in the spectrum. You can save that. So um, this is our interactive figure and a way to explore the whole spectrum from OCI. Now we're going to uh, use some of the tools that we've seen before uh, to build a water quality map of a specific area. Uh, so we're going to search uh, for the different data sets uh, from OCI and have a look uh, because we're interested in uh, data uh, products that tell us about water quality. So there's uh, many uh, data suites that will give us that. Um, but the, the one that we're going to look at today is the apparent optical properties suite. Uh, so AOP, and it's a, it's a level two product. Uh, so we're uh, working with a single scene, a, a single location here. And uh, but other suites are available, and feel free to explore that there. Again, in the data products table, you'll get more information about what's in those suites, what products are there. Um, and yeah, uh, we're going to look at one uh, water quality product uh, in that AOP suite, which is uh, the um, well, first, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll do this again. Uh, we're uh, going uh, to download uh, that AOP uh, suite file. We're going to uh, select a specific time, uh, so during the month of August, in the location we're interested in. So uh, we're working uh, in North America here. Uh, we don't want too many clouds, so we're limiting uh, the data to the amount of clouds in the in the data set, and we're searching for a level two AOP suite product. So here we have downloaded our data, and we can have a look at that data set. It's going to be a little bit different from uh, the level three data sets that we have worked on before, so we can look at the data three. Um, you can see the groups here that you've seen in the previous uh, training with Anna. Um, and as uh, she showed you, uh, the data variables uh, that we're mostly interested in are in the geophysical data group. Uh, so we can see here uh, in the AOP suite, uh, we can find the remote sensing reflectances and their uncertainties. Uh, we have some atmospheric products and we have AVW, which is the apparent visible wavelength. 
product um, I introduced a little bit before. Um, the reference uh, for that product is here. If you're interested in digging more into it, uh, it is a new product uh, coming with Pace. Uh, again, that uses the entire range of wavelengths from OCI and uh, analyzes it to uh, find the dominant wavelength or the dominant color of the water uh, in the area uh, you have. So it goes from 400 to 700 nanometers. So if it's closer to 400, closer to blue, the water is more blue. If it's closer to 700, uh, it's closer to red. So it gives an idea of the water quality. So now we can merge all the groups in that data set. Um, to have our location with our variables, as we can see here. And then we are going to uh, make our first plot uh, using uh, the longitude and latitude to uh, make a map of our whole scene. Uh, we are using the Viridis color map again because I feel it's a good match for the AVW data set. But again, feel free to explore all the color maps from Matplotlib, and you can also um, import your own or do uh, custom color maps. So we have the map of our whole scene with the longitude and latitude. Um, and we have the apparent visible wavelength variable here mapped. So what is uh, more um, towards the blue uh, is purple on this map. Uh, so the bluest waters are here and uh, it goes to 590 here. So it's more, um, more towards green or yellow. Uh, so we can see the places where the water is um, less blue <laughs> for sure. So now we're going to build our figure of our a specific region of interest here. So we're interested in um, a region around the Great Lakes. And so for that, we're going to use the set extent function that we've seen before. So, uh, so we will set our extent uh, to uh, these coordinates uh, around the Great Lakes. Um, we're uh, going again to tell Cartopite that we're using the flat curry projection. And again, for our set extent, and uh, we're going to add a background image. Um, in this case, we're using a, a different background image than uh, the um, satellite uh, Google Maps that we've used before. So uh, this one is a more generic uh, background map. Um, we uh, are uh, using a, a, a number here to set the, the level of details um, of, uh, of the background map. And, and we will uh, add grid lines. Uh, so here I do not uh, draw the labels from the grid lines. I didn't like um, how far apart they were or how close <laughs> they were together. So I set custom ticks. So that's something that you can do. So I also wanted to show you how to do this here. Um, and uh, so also we can choose the line width of the grid lines, their color, the tra transparency and the line style. Um, and then we're building our AVW map again along, to, along the longitude and latitude uh, with the Viridis color map. Oh, here we go. We have our water quality map of our region of interest around the Great Lakes. It has a background map here uh, to fill the empty space and it's using the Viridis uh, color map. Uh, so we can see what is more blue here is waters that are more blue and what is more towards the yellow is water uh, that is um, more towards the yellow in reality too. Uh, so it tells us about water quality in that region. Um, so um, it's showing uh, this AVW product that is a new product from Pace. I encourage you to uh, work with with that new product and uh, other products from Pace. Again, uh, look at the data products table uh, for that. Um, I'm going to quickly go back to my slides here. Um, I'm going to go back to my slides to uh, <laughs> to thank uh, our colleague Ian Carroll who helped us uh, work uh, on these uh, Jupyter notebooks and on these trainings today. Uh, so um, this is uh, the uh, the end of uh, my part here. So uh, thank you for attending this training.
Thank you so much, Anna and Karina, for your uh, presentations and demonstrations. Very useful to work with base data. Um, we learned about base data access and visualization using Python libraries in Jupyter Notebook. With that, uh, we are concluding this three parts uh, series on what quality monitoring using PACE. And let's look at the training summary. Uh, we started in part one, uh, overview of PACE and PACE sensors. And Dr. Manino talked about uh, the instruments they're flying on PACE, OCI, HARP2, and SPECS1. Uh, OCI observations are useful for water quality applications. But base data products are also available for oceans, estuaries, atmosphere, and land everywhere. Uh, HARP2 and SPEX1, which are polar emitters, they will aid in atmospheric correction. There are several advancements with uh, base ocean current instrument. As we saw, it is hyperspectral from 315 to 895 nanometer with 5 nanometer bandwidths and spectral sampling steps of 1.25 to 2.5 nanometers. Even at this narrow bandwidth, there is amazing signal to noise ratio. And there is high sensitivity from, for ultraviolet uh, if, from about 340 nanometers. There are nine shortwave infrared bands for atmospheric correction, uh, including turbid waters. And most importantly, PACE provides nearly daily global coverage. There are also some limitations to keep in mind. The special resolution of uh, OCI is about 1.1 kilometer. And because of that, uh, not all the inland water bodies or near shore waters can be resolved. Um, and there are challenges in the sense that uh, there is lack of verified hyperspectral algorithms at this point and need more uh, comprehensive hyperspectral field measurements. Also, currently, uh, atmospheric correction algorithms are also being revised or input. In next session, next part, uh, Dr. Morgan McKibben talked about ocean color data products, access and analysis. There are multiple levels of base data, uh, level two, level three, we talked about. Uh, we also saw that there are some provisional products um, which are uh, accepted uh, with uh, known features. And there are some uh, products we are still being tested. Um, as you can see, the green color uh, indicates products which are available now. Uh, yellow are coming soon, they are being tested now, and then there are some other algorithms are also being tested. Uh, data are available, so here is base data access landing page. A lot of information can be found there. Uh, we saw that uh, data access is through OBDAC, uh, level three data are available there, and uh, Earth Data Search provides level two data as well. Uh, we also saw that NASA Worldview provides near real-time based true color images and chlorophyll A concentration data. Uh, you can visualize and download images. We also had a brief demonstration of CDAS, how to access level three and level two data from OBDAC and Earth Data Search, and how to visualize uh, spectra as well as uh, derived products. Then today, uh, we talked about uh, ocean color data access using Python Jupyter Notebooks. And Anna and Karina, uh, they talked about how that uh, base data are located on Amazon Web Service, Cloud Data Storage, and S3 buckets. Um, overview of Python libraries for data search, download, and visualization, and streaming data from Earth Data Cloud uh, using these two. Um, Jupyter Notebook uh, scripts that we saw, they demonstrated. Um, also note that software and sample data files used in the training are available from the training web page. So this was a very uh, detailed yet very comprehensive information about uh, PACE mission, instruments, and data products. Also, we saw some applications in part two. Morgan talked about how these data are used for um, say aquaculture site selection and for say cholera prediction model.
So there's one homework assignment that is posted on uh, the training uh, web page today, and um, it's a it's you will be answering this homework on Google Forms, and the homework is due by 24th of October. So those who attended all three live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline, you receive a certificate uh, of completion via um, uh, email approximately two months after today. With that, we want to thank all our guest speakers for uh, excellent presentations and information that they provided about PACE. Um, first of all, for today, uh, Drs. Anna Windle and Karina Paulin, uh, you can contact them if you have additional questions. Thank you, Anna and Karina. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Manino and Dr. McGibbon's uh, contact information is given here. You can always contact us uh, at RSET. Here's the RSET website address and uh, social media address. And these are our sister capacity building programs if you are more interested in it, develop and severe. These are some of the acronyms we used in all three sessions. For your information, they are provided here. And additional resources and links are also given here uh, that were used and they're useful uh, for base data uh, search, uh, information, access and analysis. Um, and so with that, we want to thank you for attending today's session. And uh, we will open question and answer session now. So uh, thank you. And thank you, everyone, uh, all our speakers and all our attendees. Uh, thank you for attending today's session. We are going to move on to our question and answer session now. Um, so we're going to go through as many questions as we can. Uh, so question one, um, how many granules can be downloaded at a time? So Anna and Karina, you can unmute and answer the question. Sure, I can go ahead and answer that. Um, so there are, there's no limit to how many granules you can download. Um, you can either use the Earth Data Search uh, to download individual granules or follow the instructions while downloading to install the Earth Data Download Tool. Um, and then if you're using the Earth Access Python library, um, the files are opened or downloaded individually. So short answer, there, um, there's no limit to how many you can download. Great, thank you. And second question is, is there any cloud contamination threshold bar to filter the cloud images? Yes, so as you saw in the first tutorial um, in the Jupyter Notebook, you saw where I set a cloud cover threshold to level two data. Um, I set it to zero to 50, so any granules that had 50% or less cloud cover. I am not sure if this is a filter that you can apply in the GUI, in the Earth Data GUI. If someone else on here has that answer, feel free to speak up, but um, I know you can do it using Earth Access. Question three, is it possible to use Google Colab as a Jupyter Notebook? Yes, totally. Um, you can upload the Jupyter Notebook into Google Colab and work with the data there. Um, but just note that the Google Colab is not in the AWS cloud. Um, so the data will have to transfer from AWS to Google Colab. It's using a Google Cloud, I, I assume. Um, but yes, it is doable. Great. Uh, question four is, if we are looking for specific bands and need them in geotiff format, can Earth Access handle the conversion so that only those specific bands in geotiff format are downloaded? If you're not, um, so yes, the Earth Access library, it does not provide file format conversions. Um, if you use earthaccess.open and then the X-ray open data set, um, the bands you request are streamed to you, um, but this may be slower than downloading the whole net CDF file. So um, a way to convert them to GeoTIFF format, does anyone, I think you can do that using CDAS. If you, if you download data, open it in CDAS, I believe you can save it as a GeoTIFF and open it up in, um, you know, ArcGIS or QGIS, if that's what you're, you're asking. If, this, if that's what this question is asking. You can also use GDAL to convert formats. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. 
So question five is why do base global composite data from the ocean color website have four kilometer resolution? Is there a base place to access global composite data that have one kilometer resolution? I guess instead of reading it, do, do the people that wrote these answers, do they want to answer in case they have a better summary of it instead of me just reading? <laughs> I think Ian might have answered this one. Yeah, please unmute yourself and reply to this question. That would be great. Okay, I think um, if this is someone from OB DAC, um, Alicia, if you're there or Sean. Uh, this, is, this is Sean Bailey. Sean. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the, the answer is um, complicated. Uh, basically, it comes down to file size for the most part and spatial resolution. While the instrument does measure approximately one kilometer resolution at meter, as you get to the edge of the swath, the size of the pixels grows. And as the pixel size gets larger, it approaches the size of the bin uh, size, um, or it can actually be larger than the bin size. At the edge of the OCI swath, it's a, um, the distance between the pixels uh, in the long scan direction is approximately seven kilometers. So it is not one kilometer resolution. So binning it to one kilometer would require um, spatially uh, averaging that data over or, or uh, area weighting that one seven, uh, four by seven kilometer pixel over all of the one kilometer bins that it would cover. Um, we do have the capability of doing that. However, the size of the files grows uh, by the square of the number of pixels you pick, so or the resolution. So a, a one kilometer resolution file would be about 16 times larger than the four kilometer size. So the files get very big very quickly when we're talking about 185 remote sensor reflectance and spans, um, which is one of the limiting factors. If we were to provide a global resolution, um, um, map or global bin data at one kilometer resolution, we would probably have to come up with a way of breaking the file up so it wasn't a, uh, the projection would be, it would cover the globe, but it wouldn't, and it would be binned, but it wouldn't necessarily be one file for the entire globe because it would be rather large. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, this is Sean Bailey from OBTAC. Thank you for attending today's session and uh, helping with uh, the question answers here. Uh, question six is, can I use the data set for the Great Lakes or inland water bodies? So the answer is PACE OCI does collect data over inland water bodies. Um, the Great Lakes are large enough to be analyzed using OCI data, but not all inland water bodies are. The spatial resolution or the size of the pixel of PACE OCI is 1.2 by 1.2 kilometers. So the smallest possible water body it can work with should be about three to four times that spatial resolution. Thank you. And as you, we saw an example last uh, week uh, of looking at chlorophyllic concentration in Lake Victoria in Africa, which is big enough that yes. bees can see it. So uh, question seven, how is the index of the data set classified? Is it done with a classification algorithm reference or something else? So we weren't exactly sure what the index of the data set meant. I thought maybe it meant how we index like using 0, 1, 2 um, with the, when we print results. Um, but that's just being done because that's the order of the granule saved in that variable. We don't, there's no classification algorithm to, to do that with, but um, yeah, we weren't exactly sure about this question. So, yeah, if you can clarify the question, um, that would be nice. Or, you know, uh, index of the data set, as Anna mentioned, it really, as the granules come in, that's how it was um, just ordered, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, question eight, how can one get the uh, remote sensing reflectances of a particular point, such as a bloom event using base data and create an algorithm based on um, that RRS to map um, the bloom extent. Yeah, so Karina showed in the second Jupyter notebook tutorial how to plot an, um, our a remote sensing reflectance spectrum from single pixel. So it was that interactive map where you could um, uh, click on the map and then it plotted the, the RRS spectra. 
Um, and with that, you could use that data to, if it was in a, in a harmful algal bloom, phytoplankton bloom, you could use those spectra to, to help you know, develop a spectral library or help with an algorithm. But um, yeah, the second tutorial showed an example of how to do that. You can also do, you can also get spectra from CDAS. If you pull it into CDAS, you can use the spec, spectrum view um, and get the, the RS spectra view that way too. Next question is, are all the flags listed automatically applied to the L3 data? So these are L2 flags, I believe, yeah. Yeah, so if you open a level two or a level three data and open the L2 flag names attribute, um, you can see what flags have been applied. And also that we provided a website where it explains what flags are applied to level three data. That's good to know. And question 10 is when you name a data package, uh, results, does it override files of the same name? From yeah. Yes, yes, it does. Well, yeah, when you name um, something in Python, whatever, you know, a result, a variable name, um, if you name something else with that name, it does override. So if you want to save everything, I guess you could use different variable names so nothing gets over, over run, over rid, rid. <laughs> Question 11, can you please tell me how can I work with monthly and weekly bin data? Where can I change the code? Sure. So there is an argument called granule names um, that we used in the second Jupyter notebook from today, showing an example of filtering for monthly files. So you can actually use the filter .8d for eight day composites, or you can use .mo for monthly composites. So that's where you can filter the data and, and change between daily, weekly, monthly bin data. Great. Um... Question 12, what's the difference between remote sensing reflectance and surface reflectance? Can we use surface reflectance for terrestrial surface water monitoring? Um, I'll go ahead and let Sean answer this because I know he, he answered this on the Google Doc. Yeah, so remote sensing reflectance is a radiance reflectance and, and typical surface reflectance is an irradiance reflectance. And the difference is that remote sensing reflectance is the ratio of upwell radiance to the downwell irradiance, while our surface reflectance is the ratio of the upwell irradiance to the downwell irradiance. Um, if the water, if the surface of the water was uh, the upwelled radiance was Lambertian in that it was the same in all directions, then the difference would be a factor of pi. Um, we know that it is not, um, which is, it is not, the water leaving radiance is not Lambertian in distribution. Coming out of the water, it doesn't, the same, the radiance isn't the same in all directions. Um, so there is a bit of a difference. However, you can use um, surface reflectance if you're for doing terrestrial monitoring. There's just that caveat that what you're looking at is not exactly the same as remote sensing reflectors. That's good. That's very good to know. And question 13 is, can we download L3 data for a region of interest or do we have to download the global file and crop using XLA? Alicia, do you want to answer this one? Um. I was actually yeah. reading another one. Let me see this one again. Oh, sorry. Let me download L3 data for a region of interest. Oh, yes. Um, so I was pointing out that on the Ocean Color website, we have the OBDAC data dashboard where you can create orders, subscriptions, and set a region of interest based on your coordinates. Um, and so you can, if you make a region and then set a subscription for it, then that data will be delivered to you via email or an email link to the data. You um, can also, so just that 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 was. yes. I uh, just let you know, don't forget if you're, if the data are already in our archive, you can order that data and um, get the data uh, extracted when you order it. Yes. Yeah, and also and in week two, we had a short demo of that where again, we went in and picked uh, two regions, Chesapeake Bay and also um, Lake Victoria. So you can definitely 
subset your data spatially and temporally. Uh, question 14, where can we find more information about the atmospheric correction and flex algorithms used in the uh, product base OCI AOPRS? Sure, so um, I provided a website link um, that provides a description of how we calculate remote system reflectance in the atmospheric correction process and flags that go into it. Um, and yes, it lists what flags are applied to the level three data. So this, this site goes into detail about how we calculate RRS. Question 15, is the available data from the cloud lensy mask or do we do it in a different step? If so, are there online sources uh, teaching how to do so? Alicia, you can go ahead and answer this one. Um, which one are we on? 15? 15? I was yep. 13 15. on 13 file. Okay, yes. So masks, um, I linked to a video where our CDAS software has a lot of different mask options that you can apply to your data once you have it downloaded. And um, there's also a link in the description of that video to the CDAS software. Okay, um, hold on one moment. I'm... So the answer is, um, I didn't write the, the direct answer. You would do it in that step, so it would be separate. Okay. Uh, question 16 is, which base product shows the color of the ocean from green to blue? I think this question was referring to the composite plot um, that I had in the first tutorial. So this was just plotting a level three composite um, of the chlorophyll A concentration using a blue to green palette. So it was really the, the color palette changing the color from blue to green. Question 17, when using global map data, do we need to reproject the data if we want to observe an area of interest with the local projection or keep it as a global projection? Alicia? <laughs> Question 17. Um, this looks like the same as before. Um, it depends on what, what you're trying to do. Do we need to reproject the data if we want to observe an area of interest? I'm not sure I understand. So if, if I understand level three data, you know, you don't need to reproject, no. But I believe level two data, if you use, you you want to make sure that uh, the protection is either geographical or, you know, the one that you prefer. Uh, question 18, where is the base documentation? Can we find the tabular listing of spectral frequencies to avoid um, invalid data? Um, yes, yeah, so Karina has made amazing diagrams that show what bands to avoid where we're seeing um, issues with the data. It's not exactly in tabular form, but the diagram that she showed is on this website. Question 19, is space data only available for oceans? What about land and inland water bodies? Yeah, PACE OCI collects hyperspectral data over land as well. Um, there are 10 land data products that are currently available. You can go to this link to see them. Uh, but yes, PACE OCI, as we've mentioned, does also cover inland water bodies. And if they are large enough, um, you can use PACE data to analyze them. So you insert a question number six uh, provides more explanation. Uh Question 19, base OCI collects hyperspectral data over land as well. You can view the oh, wait, that's land, cool. land data products that are currently available here. Okay, so that's question 20 is, are the um, sphere, uh, sphere bands available on Earth data? Yes, all bands, uh, shortwave infrared bands are included in level two and level three data found in the Earth data cloud. Question 21, I tried to run Earth Data Library through Google Colab and try to install the um, 
product, um, something you need to move your cursor. The dependency, uh, depends as it, yet it did not recognize its presence. Do you know what is happening? So we figured some folks might have issues um, trying to install Jupyter Lab or using Google Colab. So um, this was probably a, um, you know, we'd have to figure out if you want to email us or use the Earth Data Forum um, to ask about this issue. We can troubleshoot with you one on one to try to get it to work. But uh, yeah, technical questions like this are probably um, going to be user specific. 22 is the data downloaded from the sites you presented during the three day training course intend, intended for reliable scientific study, or is it just used to give an overview of ocean quality? Uh, no, this is real PACE data. So the PACE data that we grabbed from the Earth Data Cloud today is the data that scientists would, would grab to use for their scientific study. So it is intended for scientific studies. However, we just launched earlier this year, so data is still pending some validation and calibration. We have provisional and test data products um, for the moment, and you can look at the status of the data products in the data products table at this website, and they will eventually get to the standard level with, when they are validated. But um, yeah, the, the data that presented during this three-day training course were data that um, is is available for everyone to use. Yes. So next question. Um, I mean, we are almost at the end of our our session today, and so remaining questions uh, will be answered, and the document will be posted on um, on our website. Um, so um, just want to thank you all for attending uh, today's session, and a special thanks to our. Um, our, our our guest speakers, uh, Anna and and Karina for today. Also, we want to thank all our guest speakers, Dr. Antonio Menino and Morgan McKibben. Uh, we have um, special uh, guests today attending from OB DAC. Uh, we want to thank them all, Dr. Sean Bailey, Alicia Scott, and Brian Franz. They are here to answer some of your questions um, about. Um, OBDAC and Earth Data. So um, we will share their contacts with you as well. Um, today, the homework is posted on the website that you will be completing by 24th of October um, on Google Form. And uh, one more uh, thing is that you will receive a survey. Uh, uh, this is post training survey that we usually have to get your feedback. So please take a few moments when you receive the survey email and answer the questions or take care of the survey so we get feedback of how we can improve what future trainings you might like. So um, that would be great if you can uh, take the survey. So uh, this concludes our um, three session training on PACE. And I also want to thank our RSET team here for helping us, uh, especially our coordinators, uh, Selwyn hudson Odoy, Brock Blevins, Natasha Johnson-Griffin, uh, we have Jonathan O'Brien and uh, Sue Monty helping us uh, with the presentations and editing. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, your help. Uh, all the guest speakers, all the participants, uh, we really appreciate uh, you attending this uh, training sessions. Um, and asking interesting questions and hope you can find uh, PACE data useful in your work. And we would love to hear from you if you um, have, if you use the data um, and uh, find useful, so that would be great.